You disgust me. You're nothing but an alternate cut. We are all alternate cuts, my lady. Ridley Scott's legend was born out of the director's desire to create a fairy tale his children could watch, a marked departure from his two most recent productions, Alien and Blade Runner. He initially wanted to adapt the medieval legend Tristan and Isolde, a project he later produced in 2006, starring James Franco and directed by Kevin Reynolds, but settled on creating an original story in collaboration with American writer William Hjortsberg, the author of Fallen Angel, the basis for Alan Parker's Angel Heart. There was a wave of epic fantasy filmmaking in the 80s, spurred on by confidence in the abilities of special effects houses like Industrial Light and Magic to realize directors' visions cost-effectively, and the blockbusting box office success of a certain space fantasy toward the end of the previous decade. Buoyed on by this confidence, Scott mounted an elaborate production featuring astonishing character designs from special effects wunderkind Rob Bottin, including the iconic Lord of Darkness, who no doubt influenced other devilish characters, and incredible set design from Asherton Gorton, who was tasked with creating a believable forest indoors, working on the James Bond 007 stage at Pinewood in England. It also featured a hot young talent in its cast, playing the innocent woodland boy turned armored hero, Tom Cruise, fresh from his success in high school drama's Risky Business and All the Right Moves. This would be his first time working abroad, the year before he hit the big time in Top Gun. Newcomer Mia Sara, then 17 years old, appeared opposite him as Princess Lily, while Tim Curry played their nemesis. But the film was beset by production woes, beginning with a fire 16 weeks into principal photography that destroyed the forest set and took the Bond stage with it. And when it was completed, the film's creators lost confidence in the result, following a less than enthusiastic test screening of the director's initial 113-minute cut of the movie. Severe cuts and other changes were made to hasten the film's pace and remove details that the director now felt were unnecessary. Most drastic of all, for the U.S. theatrical release of the film, Jerry Goldsmith's orchestral score was replaced with a hastily recorded electronic score by New Age rock outfit Tangerine Dream. The result was two markedly different films. The 94-minute European theatrical cut released in December 1985, still featuring Jerry Goldsmith's score. I'm Conrad from Movie Oubliette, and this is the version of the film I grew up with. And there's the 89-minute U.S. theatrical cut released in April of 1986, featuring music by Tangerine Dream. I'm Melinda from Retroblasting, and this is the version of the film that I grew up with. The 113-minute director's cut of the film also resurfaced after a long search and was issued on DVD in 2002 and Blu-ray in 2011. We'll talk about that too, but for the most part, let's focus on the differences between the two theatrical cuts released in the 1980s. It's not just the length and the music that differ. Each cut features shots and scenes that are unique to that version of the film, and the shots are shown out of sequence sometimes resulting in changes to the film's characters and relationships. Melinda, would you like to sit and talk with me about the differences? I do nothing for your pleasure. Oh. But I'll do it for mine. Ridley Scott was always worried that his fairy tale would be too sweet. Sweeter than bee pollen. It didn't stop him from using bubbles, though. He wanted to keep the film kid-friendly, but also wanted some darkness, which was more to his taste. After the negative responses to the test screening, he cut both theatrical versions to pick up the pace, but particularly wanted to ensure the US version focused on action, violence, and a more physical relationship between Lily and Jack. European audiences are more sophisticated, Scott said at the time. They accept preambles and subtleties, whereas the US goes for a much broader stroke. On MTV, the younger generation especially watches subpar montages all day long, which makes them impatient. You okay over there, Melinda? Your eyes kind of twitching? 
and there's this weird growling noise coming from your mic. For the MTV generation, Scott made sure audiences got violence right out of the gate, moving shots of a live prisoner being butchered from the second act dungeon sequence to being the first shot after the opening credits. There's also a fight sequence entirely absent from the European cut, in which Jack and Gump are attacked by wild beasts in Darkness's dungeons. These additions don't add much to my experience of the film, but they don't detract either. They do up the stakes, so personally, I'm okay with them. He also added a lengthy opening text crawl, which goes on far too long and further shows his lack of confidence in American audiences. It's such a dumb opening crawl, too. Yeah, what it really needs is a subplot about trade negotiations. The negotiations were short. The US version also includes more practical makeup and visual effects. Darkness is shown in the opening scene, using an alternate makeup where his skin is black and his eyes and nails are luminous green, like glow-in-the-dark Halloween novelties from a cereal box. The shots of Darkness with fluorescent nails read as pickup shots because they don't really match the reverse shot of Blix. The European version holds back the first full appearance of Darkness to the seduction scene a full hour into the movie, where he makes a breathtaking entrance through a mirror. Said Scott at the time, Darkness's entrance may be moved up to stop the audience from getting restless. Structurally, I prefer holding him back as in the European print. I actually agree with Scott on this one. I like seeing him the first time Lily does. I think it has more impact and you empathize with her horror more strongly. While I'm not a fan of the cheesy green nails, I do like the addition of Darkness pining for a mate and bemoaning his loneliness in this scene. I sit alone, an impotent exile. It makes his desire for Lily as a bride make sense and feel more like a payoff. We also see the alicorn being cut from the unicorn, while in Europe this violence was only inferred. But don't worry, we also see it being restored at the end. I think this is an improvement over the European version. I wish these shots were in there. Seeing both the removal and the restoration of the alicorn is definitely a big win for the US cut. It's one of the things I miss the most when watching the European cut. When darkness is defeated, we're treated to a miniature effects shot of him being sucked into the void of space. This one I can live without. It doesn't look that great. Oh, come on, the little shooting stars effect? You don't like that? <clears throat> okay, it's pretty cheesy. As well as more explicit action and violence, the US cut also ups the ante in the sex department. In the European cut, Jack and Lily's relationship is playful, but completely innocent. The only time they kiss is at the Sleeping Beauty moment at the end of the film, as Jack attempts to break the spell on Lily and restore her to her former self. In the US cut, they're kissing as soon as they meet up in the forest, thanks to a bit of footage stolen from the finale. It's reversed to show them kissing and Lily laying down rather than waking up. The kiss fading to a shot of the sun implies that they do a little more than just kiss as well. I think this compromises Lily a little. It looks like she's sneaking off to the woods every day for a quick shag with her bit of rough. She doesn't look so innocent here. I agree. It completely undercuts the whole idea of her being innocent and, let's just say it, virginal. It also takes a little away from the magic of the kiss at the end to see it here. At least it's not as bad as Hjortsberg's original draft of the screenplay, which instead of the dress dance sequence as a metaphor for seduction, features a sex scene between Darkness and Lily in which they spend most of the time licking each other. Ew. Quite. There are further changes that have a greater effect on how we perceive the characters. The European cut is every bit the fairy tale, with a princess who's pure as the driven snow, but capable of being corrupted and of corrupting others, including the gentle woodland boy Jack, who lives in harmony with nature and has to learn about violence in order to save her. Me, but Gump, I know nothing of weapons. You learn. Jack's character is altered to be stronger, quicker to act, and more active in the US cut. After the big freeze, we see him searching for Lily before he succumbs to the cold. This positions him more as the independent, self-assured hero we Americans tend to love, as opposed to being, much like Lily, innocent and unsure of what to do. 
This slightly diminishes his character's arc in becoming a hero. When challenged by the Gump, Jack immediately admits to taking Lily to see the unicorns. Did nothing untoward happen? I took Lily to see the unicorns. You did what? Rather than lying about it, as he initially does in the European cut. Did nothing untoward happen? No. No? No. And when he encounters the terrifying Meg Mucklebones, one of actor Robert Picardo's most memorable performances while encased in Rob Bottin's latex, Jack dispatches her instantly in the US cut. You don't really mean to eat me, do you, ma'am? Oh, indeed I do! <laughs> Whereas in the European cut, he first tries to distract her from eating him by flattering her. That would be a shame because someone as fair and lovely as yourself, Miss Meg, deserves far better than scrawny me. This also adds a nice evolution to Jack's arc. He tries everything he can think of to avoid violence, yet he's ultimately forced to fight. The US version is very abrupt and you're left amazed that they made such a great costume for Meg when she was killed off so quickly. In the European cut, Lily is definitely a princess. It's time you started behaving like the princess you are. But in the US cut, Lily is just a lady of noble birth. It's time you started behaving like the lady you are. I'm not sure why this was changed. Maybe they thought Americans don't know what princesses are, since we don't have them. Lily is also depicted as being very smart in the European version, and she's excited about learning to communicate with animals. Let me try. I'm a good student, and my father says I'm brilliant. See how brilliant I am? Let me dazzle you with my wisdom. This whole part is removed in the US version and leads to the scene where she shines a light into Jack's face, feeling very disjointed and nonsensical. Very good. Just right. On the plus side, our version thankfully only has Darkness stating that Sunshine is his destroyer once rather than twice. Sunshine is my destroyer. Sunshine is my destroyer. Arguably, one of the best scenes in the movie is the throne room scene with Darkness and Lily. The cutting of this and the parts used are quite distinct between the two versions, and while substantively they are not that different, the European cut does remove my favorite line from Lily, where she defiantly retorts to him, I do nothing for your pleasure. She is fearless in this scene. Both versions seem to hold Lily responsible on some level for what happens to the unicorns, even though she has no reason to think that what she's doing is wrong or would cause the events that follow. Was it not your sin trapped the unicorn? However, in the director's cut, there is a crucial shot of a quick zoom in on Lily's face staring defiantly back at Jack as he begs her not to touch them. Then she does it anyway. She also later states, I don't care, when he tells her that they are sacred animals. These are sacred animals. I don't care. This gives her more of an arc as well, from being selfish to being willing to sacrifice herself for the unicorns at the end. Lily's really unlikable at the beginning of the director's cut an entitled, spoiled, thoughtless little Conrad princess. While Ridley Scott cites the story of Tristan and Isolde as an inspiration, the character of Lily has more in common with Persephone with her trek to the underworld home of Hades, while Jack reads more like a young version of the Green Man or Jack of the Green as opposed to a brave knight. He's described as such in the script and the Green Man motif is present throughout the film as well. Speaking of the director's cut, one of the ways in which it departs drastically from both the European and US theatrical edits is the ending. It's the only version in which Jack and Lily don't walk into the sunset together. Upon waking, Lily reveals that she's come to a realization. You belong here. She gives Jack the ring as a keepsake. Jack vows he'll always be there for her. I'll always be here for you, Lily. And walks into the sunset alone. This ties in with the whole Jack of the Green thing, since as an immortal, Jack would not be allowed to fall in love with a human. Poor Jack, still alone. Yep. I guess once you've licked darkness, there's no going back. But let's address the elephant in the room. The most obvious difference between the two cuts is the soundtrack, and it's a big one. 
The film was originally scored by legendary American composer Jerry Goldsmith, who worked in many genres during a career spanning six decades, but is probably best known among fantastical film fans for his work on classics like The Omen, Planet of the Apes, Star Trek, Alien, Poltergeist, and Gremlins. Alien marked his first collaboration with Ridley Scott, and despite finding it a frustrating experience, during which his cues were re-edited, repositioned, and even replaced, he agreed to work with the director again. He delivered a sumptuous score, combining the forces of a full symphony orchestra, choir, and Goldsmith's characteristic battery of synthesizers to add a magical quality with both a hint of Grimm's fairy tales and Disney classics. The soundtrack also included four original songs with lyrics penned by John Bettis, best known for his collaborations with The Carpenters. Three of the songs were to be sung by Lily in the movie, and there are two dance sequences, all of which had to be composed in advance so that the music could be played on set during filming. So, wait, this was a musical in Europe? As close to a musical as I can put up with. I see. It's musical adjacent. All of the songs are diegetic. They occur within the world of the story, rather than being show-stopping breaks from its reality. Lily sings to herself on the way to the cottage, to the unicorns to soothe and lure them, and to Jack to soothe his nerves after she's touched his secret unicorn. You should never touch a man's secret unicorn. No. Her third song even includes the answer to the riddle Gump asks Jack later on. At the roots of the bluebells. Bluebells. No! The result is a finely crafted, carefully interwoven collaboration of hundreds of musical artists, creating a timeless, epic world of shimmering beauty. and terrifying power. It feels classically fairy tale and classic Hollywood. It's beautifully done, and it feels like an album I'll play while making Christmas cookies each year. But for me, it's less impactful, mostly because of its generally happy, upbeat tone. There's musically no threat of impending danger or sadness. Unfortunately, the film was considered to be problematic in test screenings. When this happens, one of the things producers often consider is a change in the score, because the soundtrack plays a huge role in establishing the tone and emotional quality of a movie. It's also less expensive to change than the visuals, which would require reshoots. Sidney Scheinberg, president and CEO of Universal, decided the film needed a commercial pop soundtrack to attract the youth market. Ridley made a fairy tale, a breakthrough visual film, Tom Cruise said to Interview Magazine in May 1986. I think the studio thought the whole piece was a little too romantic. So instead of just releasing it, Ridley said, okay, let's go back and rescore it and give it a little harder edge. They hired German New Age electronic group Tangerine Dream, not coincidentally fresh from their success scoring another Tom Cruise movie. The result is markedly different for sure, full of sampled pan pipes, analog synth pads, and kinetic drum loops. This was my first exposure to Tangerine Dream, or electronica with world music themes. A huge part of why I love this movie is the music. It's eerie, mystical, and foreboding. It appeals to my love of the minor keys prevalent in heavy metal, and this worked with the demonic visage of darkness so well that when I discovered death and doom metal later in the 90s, I think the atmosphere and imagery of this version was the foundation that my love for that music was built upon. On the other hand, I wish they had used real instruments rather than synthy samples, more like Dead Can Dance. There are sequences I like, but others fall flat for me, in particular the plinky-plonky cheesiness of the dress waltz, undermines the mystery, allure and terror of what is essentially Darkness's seduction of Lily to the dark side. I do prefer the Tangerine Dream dance section. It reminds me of a music box. But again, I would definitely have preferred the same notes be played with real instruments rather than the synth, especially here. 
Tangerine Dream's score didn't escape studio interference. Without the band's knowledge or approval, the band's final cue was overlaid with a vocal by Yes frontman John Anderson, singing lyrics he penned himself. Anderson had recently released three albums of collaborations with another electronic artist, Vangelis, who had just scored Ridley Scott's previous movie. Add to that a Brian Ferry track for the end credits called Is Your Love Strong Enough, which got its own music video featuring Ferry in the most 80s jacket ever. And the result surely is that teen market blockbuster hit the studio executives dreamed of, right? Nope. It bombed, big time. Only managed to pull in 15.5 million in the US box office. But I'm sure the European version scored internationally, right? Um... Right, Conrad? Okay, okay. It only managed to net $8 million there, so it was a failure all round. Studio executive Sidney Scheinberg went on to suggest to Robert Zemeckis that he change the title of Back to the Future to Spaceman from Pluto, despite the film not featuring either Spacemen or Pluto, and personally greenlit Howard the Duck. But he also shepherded Jaws and Schindler's List to the big screen, so maybe we should cut him some slack. For his part, Ridley Scott regretted swapping out the scores. I think uh, Jerry Goldsmith's score, with respect to Tangerine Dream, was still the best. And I think it was an error to remove it from the American version, because Jerry delivered exactly and more what I had originally asked for. And so on hearing this score again recently on this version, I realized that, you know what? Your first intuition is usually right the first time. You should stay with it. In the end, it comes down to personal taste and more than likely, which version you saw first, especially if you were a kid in the 80s. Having grown up with the US version, it's the comfortable blanket that I curl up with on a rainy night, and it's nearly impossible not to pine for the dark musical cues I know and love so well in this film. But objectively, I know that I would likely feel the same way about Jerry's score had they released the original version here. I watch the UK version like Alice through the looking glass, trying almost successfully to grasp the fairy tale splendor of the score, always falling just a little bit short. And I grew up with the slightly longer, softer European cut with Goldsmith's score. And although I love Tangerine Dream's work on Sorcerer and Near Dark, I much prefer the epic orchestral majesty and magic of Goldsmith's work for this story. I also love the slightly slower pace and fairy tale innocence of the European cut. But I can watch them both. There are parts of both I like, and neither version is entirely successful. The director's cut, which resurfaced on DVD and Blu-ray 20 years later, is a completely different experience, worthy of its own comparison video. But the important thing to note here is that overall there are no major sequences added there. Apart from the very different ending, it's mostly snippets, a line here, a beat there, all of which give the atmosphere a chance to build and the performance's time to breathe. It still doesn't quite live up to the film's legendary status. Ugh, we're really gonna end with that lame pun? Oh my lord. You cold, my lady? 